back to the Monday Morning Point Guard Podcast. On today's episode, going to be continuing the eulogy series. The Indiana Pacers have officially been eliminated from the playoffs. So going to be talking about their season as well as what they should do kind of moving forward, entering the offseason and beyond. If you did enjoy the video, please be sure to like it as well as subscribe for weekly content. Also, the podcasts are now up on Spotify, uh, so you can listen to the full episode uninterrupted there. And if there's a spot you agree with, disagree with, either reach out to us on Twitter or in that comment section, and we'd love to discuss with you. When we started the year, I'm not sure anyone, even those who are kind of skeptical of this Pacers group, thought they were going to be one of the worst teams in the league, but here we are. So what went wrong this year? Well, the main reason the Pacers were are as bad as they are is they have just been completely devastated by injuries. And I hear what you're saying. Well, every team has had a ton of injuries. Guys have missed time with COVID. That's not exclusive to them. But I, I just don't think that people understand just how many games the core of this Pacers group has missed. So let's go through a few numbers to give that some context. Miles Turner has only played 42 games. Malcolm Brogdon, 36, TJ McConnell, 24, and TJ Warren, zero. The top five Pacers in terms of games played in a Pacers jersey is as follows. O'Shea Brissett at number one, Chris Duarte, Torrey Craig, Justin Holiday, DeMontis Sabonis. The number three through five guys on that list haven't played for the Pacers or even been on the team in over a month. And as of me doing the research for this, no one has played at least 60 games in a Pacers jersey. And even if everyone plays the rest of the way, no one will reach 70 games played in a Pacers jersey. So not too many teams are going to win games under that scenario. Missing three starters plus a key role guy, that's just not a recipe for success. And it sounds like the makings of a really bad season And while it has been that, I think this is actually going to end up being a blessing in disguise. And I know most of these eulogies so far have been fairly positive and more on the positive end, with the exception of maybe the Rockets one. But I promise as we go forward, that won't be the case. There's a lot of teams coming up that I'm pretty negative on. But hear me out with this Pacers situation. Just in general, this is a franchise that didn't have the potential to hit the next level with the current with the the core entering the year they were going to be a mediocre team and didn't really have any ways to change that it's a little like being stuck in a dead-end job when you're a, a mediocre team in the NBA I used to be a claims adjuster I hated it but it paid just well enough to keep me there and it's hard to hit the reset button, and it was for me on my career, because it can be scary. You're entering an uncertain future, but you have to do it in order to accomplish better things. And it's the same thing in the NBA. Because the Pacers were forced into a pseudo tank, it has also forced their hand with some awkward roster fit situations. It was clear that the Sabonis Turner thing was not going to work out long term. This just isn't a league anymore where you can really run dual bigs. And most of the time it felt like they were just in each other's way. So the Pacers end up making a handful of deadline deals. And just to summarize, they turned DeMontis Sabonis, Karis LeVert, Torrey Craig, Justin Holiday, and Jeremy Lamb into a 2022 first two 2022 seconds, a 2027 second, Tyrese Halliburton, Buddy Heald, and Jalen Smith. That's not a bad haul. They end up with some draft picks, they get some salary relief, and they get a really special player to build around in Tyrese Halliburton. Now, in the last three eulogies, I've gone through a handful of players that I like on the team that are going to be a part of their future going forward, but the reality is most of the guys that are currently playing for the Pacers might not be even in the league going forward, forward, much less playing. So I'm just briefly going to touch on Duarte and probably not so briefly on Halliburton. 
Duarte looks like a really good player. Maybe not an all-star level guy, but a really good starter at the very least. And when you consider that coming into the league, his draft profile was that of simply a three and D wing, a high floor, low ceiling type guy. It's clear that he's much more than that. I've mentioned a couple of times this year, him being an older rookie at 24, but dude can just play. This season, he has shown an ability to create his own shot off the dribble and handle the ball in the pick and roll. And as a potential third guard behind Halliburton and Brogdon, that can be really, really good. Even eventually as a starter, the Pacers could potentially have their backcourt set up for about the next decade-ish. And I mentioned, I just mentioned how Duarte may not be an all-star, all-NBA level guy at the end of the day, but I do see that type of potential in Tyrese Halliburton. Halliburton is a ruthlessly efficient 6'5 point guard who's a really special playmaker and a really really efficient shooter to boot. And while he isn't a sharp shooter like Steph Curry or someone like that, he is a guy who could potentially be a 50, 40, 90 guy off of efficiency alone. He's at least going to, at some point in his career, be a 50, 40, 80 guy. He's a really special passer and capable of seeing the entire floor hitting anyone at any time with an accurate and on-time pass. And since joining the Pacers, he's basically 17 and 10. I really just can't emphasize enough how much I love this dude's game. Also, since joining the Pacers, he's really been running the show in something that resembles the offenses we see the Mavs run with Luka or what we used to see the Rockets do with Harden. With the extra workload of running like a heliocentric offense, you would expect the efficiency to really fall off a cliff, but that hasn't been the case, and here are the numbers. Why? With the Kings, Halliburton averaged about 77 touches per game. He had a usage rate of 18.2%. It had the ball in his hands about five and a half minutes per game. He also averaged 3.2 assists per turnover. He had a 54.6% effective field goal percentage and 57.5 true shooting. Now with the Pacers, 93 and a half touches per game with a usage rate north of 20% at 20.6%. And has the ball in his hands about seven minutes a game. Now, the assist to turnovers are down to 2.7, but the effective field goal percentage is up to 57.6 and true shooting up to 61.1. With an increased workload, he has gotten even more efficient with the exception of the assist to turnover ratio. And even with the decrease in that ratio, He's still currently 25th in the league in assist to turnover ratio, which is higher than Kyle Kyle Lowry, one of the best floor generals in the league. And even if you only factor in the time that he's been with the Pacers and not also the Kings numbers, he's still in the top 50 there ahead of names like Ricky Rubio, Drew Holiday, Draymond Green, Trey Young. And as good as these numbers are, they could be way better. I mentioned all the injuries that the Pacers have and the lack of talent that they have with the guys who are currently playing. And just too many times, Halliburton is making a great pass in a pick and roll situation to Bitadze, who's either bumbling the pass or flubbing the finish. And that isn't to say that Bitadze is terrible, but he's likely not really playing a lot for most teams. And he's nowhere near as good as what Halliburton is going to have in a pick and roll slash pick and pop partner in Miles Turner. Also, there's tons of times where Hal Burton throws a beautiful cross-court pass to a wide-open shooter who clanks it or he hits a cutter who just can't do anything with it. So next season, even if the Pacers just run it back with the guys that they already have, it's going to be a lot better than this smattering of G League guys that they're currently playing. Halliburton is just the type of player who elevates the play of his teammates, but he's also the type of guy whose own play is going to elevate the better surrounding parts he has. It goes way beyond the numbers with Halliburton, too. I've mentioned before what a great leader he is, and that hasn't seemed to change with the change of scenery. When Halliburton was traded from the Kings, his teammates were reportedly just completely devastated and beside themselves. And now that he's on the Pacers, his teammates and and the coaching staff just cannot say enough about his leadership qualities. Above all else, he's just a dude who makes the right play, and his impact on the game is always going to be way greater than what the box score says. He just looks and acts like a winning basketball player. 
if I'm going to nitpick anything for Halliburton, it's that I would like to see him get to the free throw line more and just in general look for his own scoring opportunities more. Since joining the Pacers, he's only getting like three free throw attempts a game. I would like to see that double to six in next season. In terms of this offseason, the Pacers could try to leverage this high draft pick that they're expecting into a, a veteran who can help them win in the short term. But I really think they need to embrace the youth movement here. And while the Pacers don't have the best odds at the number one pick, with the flattened lottery odds, they still are going to have something like a 10% shot at the number one pick versus 14 if they were the worst team in the league. And more good news for the Pacers here. Any of the top three guys, if they're able to sneak into the top three, are going to be really great fits for them. I know they just tried to do the dual big thing, but this year's top three are far more perimeter oriented than Sabonis or Miles Turner. So I think it could work. And even if they do fall outside of the top three, this is a really deep draft with tons of guys who are going to be able to help the Pacers right away. And with Halliburton at the point at his height, it allows them the flexibility to take a smaller score first guard like Jaden Ivey. And then outside of Ivey, even if they're out of the top four, there's still tons of versatile wings, which is never a bad thing to add to your team, even as they get closer to the 10 range. Even if they added, wanted to add a guy like Jalen Duran, that's going to give Tyrese Halliburton a great pick and roll partner for the future. Of course, if you end up taking him, I think you're likely having to move off of Miles Turner if they decide to go in that direction. And speaking of that, the Pacers are in a really interesting position with some of the guys currently on the team. They can either go into like a full-on rebuild or run it back with a lot of the same guys who are two years removed from being the number four seed in the playoffs. So let's go through a few of those keys, guys. Let's start with Miles Turner. I think he is an absolute keep at $18 million for next season. That's a really affordable deal. And what you are getting is just a super athletic big who's a solid three-point shooter and is capable of being the league's leading shot blocker. He also only just turned 26 years old, so it's not as if he's like an aging player. He can be your defensive anchor in the present and also heading towards the future. T.J. Warren is a really complicated fit here. He's going to be an unrestricted free agent this offseason. And if he suits up at the start of next season, it will have nearly been two years since he last played basketball. Foot injuries just always scare me. So I really wouldn't want to commit big money or even more importantly than that, a long-term contract to TJ. If I can get him for like one year with maybe a team option for like $8 million or less, I think that's fine. But I just wouldn't want to commit long-term to him. Ricky Rubio is also going to be an unrestricted free agent. I think you just let him go. I think TJ McConnell is a fine backup point guard. And when you have guys like Duarte and, and Brogdon and Heels who are able to play the shooting guard, and more specifically with Brogdon, he can also run point. You just don't have a lot for Rubio to do, so there's really no need to keep him. Also, really no reason to be loyal to him since you traded for him as more of a salary relief type thing, and he's never going to – he's not going to play a game for you this season. Jalen Smith is a guy I would want to bring back, but because the Suns ended up not taking his option before dealing him – the Pacers can only offer him something like $5 million for next season. So it's likely he's going to get a better offer somewhere else. But if I can bring him back, I'm absolutely doing that. For the Malcolm Brogdon and Buddy Heald piece, I feel like their fates are kind of tied together. I just don't feel like you need both with the emergence of Duarte. And I think Brogdon is the much better player and much better fit for the team. So it, it, given that he can play off or on the ball he does some playmaking stuff so you could do like this yin and yang kind of thing with Halliburton and Brogdon playing off of one another also given they roughly make the same amount it seems like Buddy is more expendable in that scenario I wouldn't want to just give healed away though I, I wouldn't expect much back but I would want something back his contract just isn't as bad as it, it's kind of talked about it's only for two more seasons and it was front loaded so it's getting less and less every year and then also since joining the Pacers as a starter buddy looks a lot better 
numbers wise, but mainly just eye test wise. He looks way more engaged. He's making better decisions. And too many times with the Kings, he just wasn't giving any effort in whatsoever on the defensive end. And offensively, he just became like this black hole where the ball would just go to like disappear, basically. He would just get the ball and just be like, screw it. I'm shooting. I don't care if this is a good shot. I don't care if I'm covered. I don't care the situation, time, score, whatever. I'm just going to shoot almost out of spite and contempt. And in the couple of games I've watched him play with the Pacers, he just isn't doing that. He's taking some pretty high quality shots that are within the flow of the offense. And just in general, he seems to be kind of re-energized and and just happy. It's funny how leaving the Kings will do that. But I think if you could get significantly more in a Malcolm Brogdon trade than trading Buddy Heald, I'm willing to do that. And here's why. Malcolm Brogdon played 75 games his rookie year, 64 in his third season, and hasn't hit the 60 win mark any other time. Sorry, 60 game mark uh, for games played any other time in his career. Even though basketball fit wise with Brogdon, it would be much better than healed. He just isn't out there enough on the court to make him untouchable. And the Pacers should absolutely put some feelers out there just to see what the market would be for him. But I absolutely think the Pacers should be keeping one of either Brogdon or Heald. I don't think there's any reason to do a full teardown here. Unless they draft someone like Jaden Ivey, maybe Johnny Davis. I think in that case, both Heald and Brogdon are expendable. But I I think if you're drafting like a wing or if they sneak into the top three, I think you should keep one of them. Free agency-wise, the Pacers just aren't going to be in contention for your Bradley Beals, your James Hardens, those type of guys. But they can still round out the roster really effectively if they're smart. They're going to have about $32 million in cap room if they don't re-sign anybody. And and what do they need? I think wings are going to be the name of the game for them. I like the guard situation here, regardless of whether they draft someone or not. And big wise, I think you would be fine with the Turner Jackson Batadze situation. It's really just going to be getting players of quality who can play in that three to four spot. Sadly, though, this just isn't a strong free agency class for those wings or just a strong free agency class in general based on who I think is going to be resigning, like guaranteed. Like I think Bradley Beal is probably resigning. James Harden's probably resigning. Kyrie Irving's resigning. Zach Levine's probably resigning. So outside of those guys, like it looks on paper like a really good class, but those guys are all probably resigning. So Miles Bridges for the Hornets is a guy I would absolutely target if I'm the Pacers, but the Hornets are likely going to be matching any offer that he gets. Otto Porter Jr. is a guy that I would target, though for like a stretch four position he's been solid throughout his career and this season with the Warriors he's shown he's still a really good role player and the Warriors aren't going to likely want to pay him because they're already way into the luxury tax so if you gave him like two to three years five to eight million I I think that would be fine Kyle Anderson might be a guy the Grizzlies aren't interested in bringing back, so he could be a nice fit as well. And then, like, to a lesser degree, talent-wise, you've got guys like Nick Batum, Derek Jones Jr., maybe Joe Ingles coming off of that injury, maybe Torian Prince, James Johnson. I think all would be worth taking a look at. Sadly for the Pacers here, this is going to be one of the toughest positions to fill, but it should be aided by whatever they end up drafting, be it a top three pick or if they slide into the four spot or even into that five to 10 range, they're going to be able to grab something that's really going to help them. Overall, though, of the teams that aren't making the play in this year, this might be the team that is positioned best for the start of next season and going forward. Maybe you would like the OKC situation better because of all the draft picks they have, but I think the Pacers are the clear number two on that list for sure. They're going to be able to grab something that really helps them in the draft. They have cap room, tradable contracts, and, and, and young players that they can build around. They basically still have the core of the team that made it as the fourth seed in the East two years ago, minus Sabonis and an injured Victor Oladipo, who you are replacing with Tyrese Halliburton and a top pick in this year's draft. I think that's a trade most teams would take. 
Um, especially given the direction that Oladipo's career appears to be going in. And the Pacers are just positioned really well to make the playoffs next season, or at least to play in, and they still have room to grow and improve with a relatively young roster. If they play their cards right in free agency and, and with regards to the draft, they're going to be able to position themselves to make a really strong offer for the next, next disgruntled star if they so choose. All of the injuries and the bad season just came at the perfect time for them, and it was a blessing in disguise. It forced them to move off of a few guys that were weird fits, and it's going to let them retool with a young, potential star point guard and a high draft pick and a deep draft, while still holding on to the pieces that got them home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs just two years ago.